First Peter, chapter one. First Peter, chapter one. I had uh, full intentions of doing three verses tonight, but I got waylaid by my notes. And uh, the uh, let's see here. So uh, we are just going to cover one verse tonight, and that is verse seventeen. Now I am going to start reading in a little bit. Uh, from verse, let's see, where do I want to start? I think I'll start with verse 13. But you, uh, you recall that the opening of 1 Peter chapter 1, there's a long sentence that begins in verse 3, goes all the way to verse 12. Now, the English translators have broken it up into sentences in English for us, but in the Greek, it's one long sentence. So Peter is extolling... Uh, God for the great salvation that we have, and then he begins to start in on the consequences of that salvation. And that's what we've been working on now these last few weeks. And uh, I, uh, the, uh, our English translations give us th- these consequences as a series of imperatives. But we learned last time, or a couple times ago, that in the original, it, it doesn't use imperatives it uses the grammatical term as participles with imperatival force. But anyway, they are, but they're the foundation of the imperatives. So we're going to highlight those in just a moment, but I want to read the passage. I'm going to, going to begin in verse 13, and we'll get to verse 17. And verse 17 is sort of, the thought isn't complete in verse 17. It sort of goes on in the next verses. But there were so many things I wanted to talk about in verse 17 that I thought, well, we'll just... It won't get time to get through anything else. So beginning in verse 13. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. If you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. All right, so we're going to stop there. That's our uh, our text is verse 17. Now, I, I want to remind you, just to sort of review where we're at, these imperatives that He's flow. We have this great salvation. All right, so consequently, fitting in verse uh, uh, 13, therefore, so therefore, there's a lot of things he wants us to do. The imperative in verse 13 is fix your hope completely on the coming grace. So there's the grace of the Lord that is going to come with the Lord Jesus Christ, the grace of of, uh, a renewed body, uh, uh, a resurrection body, uh, fellowship with God forever, our home in heaven, all of that is coming. And so fix your hope on this. Don't, don't let your mind be clouded up. That's the first participle. Uh, clear your minds for action, or as the King James says, gird up the loins of your mind, beginning of that verse. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. That means that the things that, uh, they may be legitimate interests that you're involved in, but they they actually will impede your race, your work for God. So just discipline your minds. Get that, fix, that hope fixed on the Lord. Lay aside those things that don't matter. And then the second uh, participle there, bolstering, fixing your hope, is to, uh, is to be sober, to keep sober in spirit, that you might be, uh, that you, you approach the things of God seriously and that you uh, are. Uh, you're not frittering your way, your life away on frivolous things, I guess is the idea behind that word. Then the next commandment is in verse 15. It's actually the, the word, be holy. Or, and the way it goes actually in the Greek, it, it talks about be, holiness, and then it says just be. That's, your, that's what you're supposed to be. Be holy, all right? Be holy. All right, and it has a support of uh, verse 14, don't conform yourself to your former lust. That's, again, this is a condition you should be in. You don't want to be conformed to that old way, but instead, be holy. That's where the commandment is. 
That's what he wants you to do. Now we have another imperative in verse 17. He doesn't do this participle. He had two in the first one, one in the second one. This one has no participles. I'm not sure what that means, but it's just there. Anyway, so verse 17, we have another command. Uh, and he starts in this conditional statement. If you address the, as Father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear. That's the imperative. And that's the, uh, that's the title I've taken for this message. Conduct yourselves in in fear. Now, uh, and, and it's interesting, again, in this particular verse, he puts that commandment right at the end of the verse. So he says all these other things, and then, you know, conduct your life, conduct yourselves in this way. All right, so it's right at the end. Anyhow, there's a couple of things that are noted. I have a quote from one of my commentaries. As with the two pre previous imperatives, this one is also apparently decisive. Set your way of life. Conduct yourselves in fear. Now, uh, what do we mean by that? I want to be sure I've given you these grammatical terms. I hope you understand or you have some glimmer of what that means. But I'll just give you a little, i give you these little grammar lessons. You'll probably forget them and that's fine because I'll give them to you again. And you'll think, oh, he's got great insight because he keeps saying these things. But anyway, so there are these various ways of expressing yourself in Greek. The present tense is one that gives it what we call linear action. So it's almost pictorial, like if you're using the verb run, if it's in present tense, you see somebody running across the field. So step by step, you see the, that process. That's what's being expressed by the Greek present tense. But if you say, uh, if you put it in the aorist tense, he ran, well then the whole thing's in view. The whole run all the way across the field. And so the whole thing is in view. So when we think about this, uh, what this is, is, is now conduct yourselves in your life. Uh, it's not be conducting yourselves, in other words, you know, getting a habit, but this is just your whole life. This is what it's supposed to be. Conduct yourselves this way. Every day, all, everything about your life is to be conducted in fear of the Lord. So we'll get to what that means in just a moment. And another... Uh, I guess I've already touched this. this. But my point is, this is a command for life. It's a command for the whole thing. And it's very decisive. It's not, you know, it's a, it's a, you have to respond to this call. All right, well, what else do I want to say here about this? Let's look at our verse now. And I give you, I have a proposition. Your salvation puts you in a new relation to God, which obligates you to conduct your life on a heavenly pattern. Right? So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. This new relation that we have to God. So the ground of our commandment is this new condition. And I already mentioned this is a conditional statement. It's a conditional statement is one that starts with if, and then it has a, a then statement. So the if statement is the condition. Then the then statement is, okay, if that's true, then this. All right, you understand that. And, uh, you know, I... Another little grammar lesson, uh, there are many different ways, or there's several different ways, I guess we should say, of expressing conditional statements in Greek, and they use different forms of the word if to help us to determine which one it is, but it conveys a slightly different meaning each time. Uh, and this one is called a first-class condition. What that means is it assumes the conditional statement is true for the sake of argument. And in this case, the sake of the conditional statement is true, right? It doesn't have to be true, but in this case it is true. So let me explain what I mean. Let's look at our verse. If you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work. He's talking about God. All right, if you address him as father, in other words, if he is your father. Now who is he speaking to as he writes this letter, he's writing to Christians. So the idea is, he is your father. Okay? You could translate it simply by the word since. Since uh, you address God as father, okay, the one who, since you address the one who judges impartially as father, conduct yourselves. Okay? Then conduct yourselves. However, one commentator said, Nevertheless, translating if as since is mistaken. Peter intentionally wrote the sentence as a hypothesis 
to provoke the readers to consider whether they call upon God as their father, desiring surely that they would answer in the affirmative. The word since does not have the same effect, and therefore, if should be retained. So if somebody now, if we're reading and listening to Peter say this to us, I guess, uh, if, here's the sentence, if you address as father the one who impartially judges. All right. There's a question for you in that statement. If you address him as Father, do you? See, there's a question. And that's why this commentator points out that the if has value. If if you address him as Father, well, do you? Are you born again? Do you really know him? So that, that is a, uh, that is a uh, uh, challenging thought. Well, then... Uh, he is expecting you're going to say, yes, I do. The way he's written this condition, he's expecting you to say, yes, I do. Yes, I, I'm one of those. All right. Then, conduct yourself in fear. But there's an interesting little twist to this. It was quite, I ran across this in one of the commentaries. He was actually commenting, he's commenting on a different, or not a commentary, in a grammar. He was t- commenting on a different verse, but he cited this verse as, a, as an example of the same thing. And here's the thing that he uh, noted, that this this assumed conditional statement, right? he said, that makes the result, the then part of the statement, uncertain. If you address as father the one who judges impartially, then conduct yourselves in a certain way. Well, the thing that is uncertain, he is expecting a certain answer in the first part. The thing that's uncertain is whether you're going to conduct yourselves the way he's asking you to. It makes the second part somewhat conditional. Do you see what I'm saying? The question is, all right, so you're saying yes to that first idea. If you address his father, all right, is he your father? Yeah, so I say, well, yes, he's my father. Well, then, conduct yourselves in this way. Now, are you conducting yourselves in this way? You see, so there's, there's a real force to the way he's, instruct, he's constructed this. He wants you to behave in a certain way. But he wants you to do it because you have a new relationship with God the Father. All right? So the, for believers, I put in my notes here, the question mark is their conduct. We all know our own selves. Okay? We ab- and we observe others. And the part that is really conditional is much more our response than the fact of our salvation. So, since we have this new condition, we have this new relationship with the Father, will we follow through on the command? Now, there's a few details in there that I want to touch on again in a little, in a little bit. But I want to work through this, uh, 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 sort of the structure of the verse first. Second point I want to talk about is what I call the potentiality of the command, which is our response. And so I want to show you the word order. This is, I'm going to, to do that, I'm going to give you Young's literal translation. And I find this very interesting. I don't know if you do, but I just find it fascinating. So here we are. This, uh, I've quoted here, 1 Peter 1.17 in Young's literal translation. And if on the Father you, ye do call, okay, who without acceptance of persons is judging according to the work of each, in fear, the time of your sojourn pass ye. All right, so you see, the imperative is right there at the end. That pass ye, that's the conduct yourselves. All right, and it's right at the end of the verse. And there's all of these things put into the uh, beginning uh, before that. Now, the conditional statement, if... You call on the Father, and then there's a description of the Father as the judge. And then there's a description of conduct and the state of persons, all right, the, the, the state of our life. Then, conduct yourselves. So there's all of this stuff packed in here. The condition then, the question is, will you conduct yourselves in this way? Will you live in this way that Peter is advocating? Now, <clears throat> there are a couple of things that will compromise the way someone will respond in their conduct before God. I've listed them 
here. The low, a low view of God and over-familiarity compromises conduct. Now, we do address God as Father. And uh, there's passages that we'll use. It doesn't use it here, but there are passages that, that will reference the Aramaic word Abba. You know, you've heard of that one. Abba, Father. You, prob- you may have heard that some people will say, well, that's when, uh, when a child would speak to their father, a little child would speak to their father and say, Abba, that means it's similar to our daddy. And so then people will talk, some people, I guess, will talk, some Christians, about God as their dad upstairs kind of thing. Now, the thing is, that's not what Abba means. I mean, it is the thing a child would say to his father, but it's much more formal than our daddy. And there is a certain... um, there is a certain tendency, I would say, amongst Christians today to become very informal about their faith, very informal about their walk with God, very casual. And so there's a lot of things that slip into conduct because they have a low view of God. And we talked last week about be ye holy, for I am holy. You see, that elevates the standard very high. What is the standard of God? Perfection. He's perfectly holy. And so, when you're called, be holy for I am holy, all right, conduct yourselves in fear, because you have this relationship with God. All right, how about you? In your conduct, the things that you choose to do, the things that you sort of have maybe a little conscience, I shouldn't, maybe ought to do that. Or maybe after you've done it, your conscience says, you really shouldn't have done that. Now, what do you do about those kind of things? Do you repent and confess and get things right with God? And, and um, if you've hurt somebody else, do you confess to them and ask for forgiveness? Are you, In other words... Is your approach to your, your spiritual life serious or is it casual? And I think there's too much of an emphasis on casual today. That's, I guess, what I'm getting at. It's easy for me to say because, you see, I'm not that casual. But I am a sinner, you see. All right. And... That diminished attitude to God, also, there's a weakening in the concept of fear. There's a, there, there's a weakening of just addressing God. God is my, you know, my dad. We say it that way. That's, I don't like to say that. That's, not, that's too familiar. But then this word that we're going to look at here, the word for fear, that gets toned down somewhat. So we're going to talk about that in just a minute here. Um, All right, so so now the last part of this message, I want to talk about the motivational factors supporting the command. All right, we got the command down. If you address God as Father, yes, I do, then conduct yourselves in fear. That's the command, right? Okay, so we got that part down. Why should I? What motivates me? Well, the fact, first of all, the fact that God is our Father. Now, there's a beautiful passage I've you don't have to turn there. I put it in the notes. you got the notes in front of you. And this, one of the commentators pointed to this passage. It's in Jeremiah chapter 3. And it's quite remarkable. Uh, it's a prophecy to, to Jerusalem, but it's also a prophecy about the nations. So notice this. I bolded the parts that I wanted you to see. At that time, they will call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations will be gathered to it. You see that? All right, so the... Jeremiah is prophesying about the time of restoration for the Jews. We've gone through this in the Old Testament prophecy. And we've talked about all those promises God made to the Jews and the kingdom that's coming and all of these things. And, and so there's a great expectation for the nation, but notice this, and all the nations. The Gentiles are going to be there. All right, you see that? Will be gathered to it, to Jerusalem, for the name of the Lord. Nor will they walk anymore after the stubbornness of their evil heart. Who? The nations won't. 
In those days the house of Judah will walk with the house of Israel, and they will come together from the land of the north to the land that I gave your fathers as an inheritance. Then I said, How I would set you among my sons and give you a pleasant land, the most beautiful inheritance of the nations. And I said, You shall call me my father and not turn away from following me. Now here's the thing. God is our father and we are adopted in to that spiritual family just as Israel, our, uh, believing Israel, is the, is the uh, inheritor of the covenants with Abraham, uh, Moses, and David, and all of the promises that God made in the Old Testament, we, we get to call the same God our Father. We get to be a part of that same covenant. And this relationship is God's good grace to us, whether we're Jew in our background, or we're Gentile. If we're belie- if we- Here's our verse. If you address as father this one, this is what's happened to you. You're in this new relationship. So this is your motivation for conducting yourselves in fear before him, because you have this relationship. The second thing that is a motivator is the fact that our father is an impartial judge. The word for impartiality is very interesting. It's a, it, the, it's a made up of a combination of words that means to receive the face. So to, to show respect for a person, you're going to receive the face of that person. You're going to lift that person's face up. You're going to, you know, there's certain ones you're going to receive, certain ones you're going to reject. All right. Now, this word is actually, uh, let's see, uh, I think I want to say this now. It's a little further in my notes, but um, let's see. Oh, I see where it is. Okay, so this word for face in Greek later came to refer to the mask that the actor in a stage play would wear. You know, he'd have a happy face if he's a happy actor, or a sad face if a sad actor. All right, and the uh, now the the whole idea of being partial, the the actor is the name for actor is the word hypocrite, okay? Because he's putting on a face. Okay, if you're receiving a face, you are you're receiving one, but you're rejecting another. You see, so that's the word picture. Um, God knows who we really are, so we have to we and he will he's impartial. He's not going to he's not going to be fooled by any face that we put on, and he will. Uh, accept us just as we are. And so this, the way this is constructed makes impartiality an inherent aspect of his character. And that is the big point. The fact that our father is an impartial judge. He will, he is not going to say, well, you know, he's my, uh, you know, he's my beloved child and uh, I'll let him get away with that one. That's not the way God is. All right. So a motivation for fearing the Lord, conducting yourself in fear, is... The fact that God is impartial. Also the fact that God is just. Notice how it says, if you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work. According to each one's work. It's not, uh, there's nothing that you can bring. He knows everything there is about you. He is a just judge. Uh, In our day, justice seems to mean, let me do what I want. You know, this is what the activists, we want justice. Well, what they want is to be able to do what they want. Okay, but God is just. He judges according to, proportionately, to the real value of what we do. And then the next motivator, okay, the fact, motivator, first of all, the, uh, that we have this relationship with God. He is our Father. Secondly, that he's impartial. Thirdly, that he is just, and he will judge justly. And then, fourthly, the fact that our appropriate response is rooted in fear. All right, so let's look at our verse again. If you address his father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during your time of stay on the earth. So, you're familiar probably with the idea that the fear of God for the believer is more reverence than craven fear you know, or terror. You know, we, um, if you have somebody who doesn't know God and who is a sinner and they come before the presence of God, 
the, the holy judge of the universe, you can imagine that that person would be filled with terror. They're, that's a different kind of fear of the Lord than the, the believer has. Now, one of the things, and, and so we'll tend to say, well, when we say fear of the Lord here, we mean to have reverence for the Lord. Well, we do mean to have reverence for the Lord. But again, just as we have, I think, watered down this relationship and been a little too casual about God, we have somewhat uh, weakened the idea uh, of fear. I've got a couple of quotes that I think will uh, add to this. So first of all, abject terror certainly does not fit the joy and boldness of the Christian life. Reverence, however, can be watered down so that it becomes rather insipid. This is Tom Schreiner saying this. There is a kind of fear that does not contradict confidence. A confident driver also possesses a healthy fear of an accident that prevents him from doing anything foolish. Now, he can get overconfident and get in trouble. A genuine fear of judgment hinders believers from giving in to libertinism. All right, so talking, using that driver illustration, remember when we moved out to Souk and, and uh, Wolf was helping us. I don't know if you remember this, Wolf. But uh, he was, uh, you may remember helping us. I'm sure you don't remember uh, what I'm about to say. Okay, and uh, so he was following me. Now, I've driven out to Souk quite a bit. I'm very familiar with the road, even before I moved there. And, and then once we were get, doing the move and all the stuff, we were in and out there a lot. I, know, I, see, I just know where you have to slow down and where it's okay to go a little faster. And we got there, and Wolf goes, Boy, you sure drive that road fast. <laughs> okay, but I didn't have any fear. Now, uh, if I were going 20 kilometers an hour faster than my average... I might have had some fear, right? A, a driver, he had, he, I had a lot of confidence, but if I was going faster, that confidence would erode, right? And I would, so my, my fear restrains me. Do you see the, the illustration, what I'm trying to do with this illustration? So a genuine fear of judgment hinders believers from giving in to libertinism. Libertinism is living any way you want. Well, you know, we, we're not saved by works, we know that. But, you know, we serve God, and we're, we have this relationship with the Father, and we're called to conduct ourselves in fear. And, you know, I don't want to do something that God is going to bring, going to displease God. There is a sense in which I know that God can, you know, he may, not, he may take me to heaven, but he may take me so as by fire as the, uh, you know, save so as by fire, as the scriptures say. You know, so there's, there's, uh, there is a potential for a certain amount of restraint because of our fear of God. One more quote here. This one comes from Selwyn. He says, The word reverence has suffered through being almost confined in common parlance to behavior at worship. So we think about, we're going to be reverent, we think about coming into church and being reverent in a worship service. It has its focus in worship, but as this passage shows, should govern the whole conduct of life and every thought of man. So this idea of reverence is you should be living your life. Conducting your life in fear means to be reverent, to be uh, uh, sober, as he said earlier, uh, every moment of every day of her life. Uh, and so, uh, let's see. I want to go on to the next thing. Uh, this is in the notes, it's letter E. Uh, we're almost to our time. I see the buses here, so if maybe somebody could go meet the bus out there and just have them uh, wait for a bit for Dorothy. All right, uh, okay. Uh, let's see. I don't know how to... Sometimes my notes, they made sense when I wrote them, and I don't quite know how to make sense of that for that first point. So let's look at the word here. When we're talking about conduct yourselves, the, the root of this word has the idea of, of uh, just sort of turning every which way, turning hither and thither, I, I, I noted, in the course of life. And... Um, 
you know, anywhere you might go. So it came to parallel the Hebrew idea of walk, so the whole course of life, every aspect of the course of life. And so the, you're called to live in fear through all the days that remain to you. So it's a comprehensive, and this is where I was trying to get with my point that I didn't understand. Uh, you're, you're called to live in a comprehensive way. Everything about your life should be uh, comprehensive. And then, this is because these days that remain are your days of sojourning during your stay on earth. We're thinking about the rest of our life. We only have so many days to live. And the, um, uh, the uh, I have a quote here, the compound noun basically means alongside the house, having the position of an outsider and not a member of the household. It is used in Acts of the sojourn of Israelites in Egypt. The present earthly life of the believer has that character because Christ's call has taken him out of the world. And so we're conducting ourselves in the rest of our life, in our sojourn on earth here. And this word emphasizes that you are just visiting. This world is not your home. You don't belong here. Your home is in heaven. And you are, there is a certain aspect of your relationships with other people who do not believe in the Lord, that where you're, uh, you feel like you're not in sync with everything they think. And you're out of step. And conducting yourself in fear, in reverence to the Lord, every step of the way in your life is the way your mind is becoming oriented as a Christian. You're beginning to think this way and practice this way and live this way. And you find yourself running into things that other people believe, that other people practice, that they don't quite, they think you're a little weird, quite frankly. They think that the way you've chosen to live your life is, uh, is very restrictive, that you're, uh, you're too narrow. And so consequently, uh, you find yourself not, um, uh, not in sync with the world, and yet God has called you through the rest of your life to live a life out of step with the rest of the world, but in step with him. So conduct yourself in fear. There's these motivations, the idea that he is calling you to all of your life. He is calling you... Uh, to, uh, uh, to, to fear him. He is calling you because he is the judge. He is calling you because he's impartial. And he's calling you because he is our father. So those are the five motivations that I came up with here. Here's my proposition once again. Your salvation puts you in a new relation to God, which obligates you to conduct your life on a heavenly pattern. There's so many things in here I... I feel like I haven't really done justice to all of them, but I do hope that there has been some help to you and encouraging you in your conduct. There is nothing in our world that has enough value to hang on to. You know, there may be certain activities that the Lord may call you to give up in your life that, that perhaps you did in the past. And uh, yesterday, as some of you know, I was in my hometown in Alberta, uh, perhaps for the last time. I don't know if I'll ever go back there again. And I cleared out my parents' safe deposit box. And uh, I, always, I joke with the banker, there's no negotiable securities in here. It's like, it's just stuff that dad kept. And uh, they had value to him. Uh, and he's now gone. You know, here they were, they're sitting all these years, they're paying a safety deposit box fee. I'll tell you a couple of things that were in there. One was one of my report cards from high school. Now, none of the other kids, it's just me. I do want the rest of the family to know. It's just me. And there was also one of my report cards from my freshman year at Bob Jones. Now, why they're in there, I don't know. But he put them in there. All right? But he's gone now. He had valued those things, but now he's gone. And now what am I going to do with these pieces of paper? Well, being me, I'll keep them. But <laughs> then my kids will have to decide what to do. Okay. The thing is, we can't hold on to these things. We can't hold on to this life. Okay. So conduct yourself in fear. Only our relationship with God lasts forever. And so let's fix our hearts and fix our conduct. <laughs>